Hi, I'm Bobby Wilding, Deputy Director of Clean and Healthy New York. Welcome to the webinar on how to reduce toxic chemicals in uh, child care settings. We'll be spending about a half an hour going through a, a broad overview of um, why it's important to do this and specific tips that you can use in your program to make effective changes. All right. So our learning objectives are uh, we would like you to understand why children are more susceptible to chemicals in their environment, what the chemicals of concern are that are found in early care and learning programs, and um, some practical tips that you can use. So uh, before we begin, let me just briefly tell you a little bit about Clean and Healthy New York. So our organization, Clean and Healthy New York, was founded in 2006 with a mission to protect people's health by getting toxic chemicals out of everyday things. So we achieve that in three primary ways. One, we uh, conduct policy advocacy. So we work to change laws at the local, state, and federal level and to protect existing laws and make sure that they're implemented effectively. We conduct market campaigns where we engage retailers and manufacturers in the marketplace using economic pressure to get companies to make changes, to drive changes further up the supply chain so that we all get safer products. And uh, we educate. So we've trained hundreds of child care providers across New York State, people just like you. Uh, but we also train nurses, we train uh, families, and uh, work to educate policymakers about critical issues. And finally, the way that we achieve our victories is by collaborating. We work with groups with a wide range of interests who all have a common purpose in protecting people's health and addressing environmental concerns. So, uh, whether it's an environmental organization, a child care organization, uh, a health care provider, uh, we work together to make the biggest impact, and that's how we win. So to start off with, when I talk about environmental health, most of the time people don't really know what I mean. And it's pretty simple. You know, your environment is, are the things that are outside of you, uh, and your health is your state of well-being inside you. And so environmental health means those things in our outdoor or outside environments, whether it's in our homes, it's the products we put on our skin, um, or the air that we breathe, and how they impact our ability to stay healthy and well. So some of the common things that people are familiar with include lead in drinking water. That's been a big deal. Of course, lead is also found in um, aging, uh, housing, paint, uh, and other places. But um, folks usually have heard that lead can contribute to IQ loss and a whole host of other health problems. Uh, air pollution from cars is another example of an environmental health concern uh, where the air pollution can trigger asthma, cause heart disease, and other things. Tobacco smoke is another very commonly known environmental uh, problem where the smoke can contribute to lead cancer. And uh, chemicals and products, which is the area that our organization has really focused on, can do all of those things. Um, and because there's such a wide range of chemicals that are used in these products, uh, they can have a wide range of health impacts. And so in New York State, Mount Sinai School of Medicine actually did an economic analysis. And what they determined was that just for children, just looking at some diseases like cancer and asthma um, and learning and developmental disabilities, it costs our state $4.35 billion dollars annually. Um, and so that's a huge impact on um, a whole host of things, not just the personal health of any particular child, but also impact to families, impact to, impact to schools, impact to the healthcare community. So how do chemicals get in our bodies? And if we were in person, I'd be asking for volunteers to name some. But uh, for today, let me just walk you through it. There are three primary ways where we uh, uh, can, in which we can uh, get chemicals from the outside of the world into our bodies. And so one is we ingest them, we eat them or drink them. Um, you can see the babies chewing on the rubber ducky, so it's not just food. Uh, we inhale them, so obviously uh, particles in the air or chemicals in the air uh, we can breathe in. And we absorb them through our skin. So uh, if we're rubbing lotion on ourselves or we're getting sprayed with a um, cleaning product or any of those kinds of things, we can actually absorb chemicals through our skin. If we're picking up a receipt and handling it, the chemicals that are on the surface can actually absorb into our skin. 
And unfortunately, another way that we're all exposed is before we are even born, uh, we can be exposed to the chemicals that are present in our mother's bodies in prenatal exposures. And so there's been studies that find hundreds of chemicals of concern in cord blood from newborns. And uh, it's something that we need to be protecting ourselves and particularly protecting women throughout their adult lives so that if and when they do choose to have children, their bodies are a healthy environment for those developing fetuses. So you would think that in 2018, with uh, how much you hear about regulation, that chemicals would be uh, something that would be taken care of. And unfortunately, it's not the case. Uh, we are exposed to a myriad, a whole host of harmful chemicals and benign chemicals every day. There are over 80,000 chemicals in use in our commerce, in products, in formulations, and the stuff we touch, the, the chemicals we use, what goes on in industrial settings, uh, and new technology and products are coming forward all the time. And unfortunately, the laws that were created to uh, address these chemicals have not been strong enough. So in the 1970s, the Toxic Substances Control Act was passed, but it included some economic considerations that meant that even things like asbestos were not fully regulated, despite how clear the evidence was that they ca it causes lung cancer. Uh, in 2016, the um, Toxic Substances Control Act was updated, um, and while the language that was written offers some opportunities for us to do better when it comes to regulating chemicals. Right now, the people who are actually running that program have been hired away from the American Chemical Street, excuse me, the American Chemical, uh, the American Chemistry Council, and uh, they are running the program in ways uh, and implementing in ways that are incredibly weak, leaving us with fewer protections than we had even a few years ago. Um, over the years, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency was able to conduct uh, full evaluations of only 250 chemicals, and only five chemicals have had real bans put in place. Um, most of the other changes that have happened have been voluntary, and the laws just simply don't have enough teeth to really drive the market completely. So you might wonder, why would we focus on children? And it's pretty uh, straightforward. Children are not little adults. So what they experience and when they're exposed to chemicals uh, have a different impact. And there are a bunch of different ways. And again, if we were in person, I'd be asking for hands to be raised. But there are three primary ways that they're different. They, they have different behavior, right? So they are exploring their world, and they're putting everything in their mouths. They're putting their hands in their mouths after they touch things. They're putting everything that they pick up into their mouths. Um, and uh, they are crawling around on the floor so they're coming into contact with a different environment than we are. Um, in fact, there's a very different, there's studies that show that the air quality down close to the floor, and particularly if there's carpeting, um, is contains more chemicals than higher up because they settle. Um, and so babies are exposed and breathing in different air than we do as adults. Um, so their environments are different. Also, their consumption. They, pound for pound, because they're developing so rapidly, they have to take in more. So they breathe more air, pound for pound, than adults do. They drink more water or beverages, and they consume more food. So their total intake for their body weight is much higher. And finally, it's their development. So our, their bodies aren't finished. When babies are born, they still have a lot of development to go through. And so the, in the child care arena, there's been a lot of discussion about best practices for engaging uh, babies in, over the first thousand days to make sure that they have a lot of developmentally appropriate activities to help their brain connections occur. And what we understand is that those first thousand days are also critical for all of the organs in their bodies. Everything is still de under development, which means that chemicals coming and interfering with that development can have much um, more profound consequences and lead to, lead to lifelong uh, potential health impacts. So, uh, the part of the reason that we're concerned and are looking particularly at children is that actually diseases and disorders of environmental origin, so things that are triggered by or contributed to from chemicals and things outside a human body, is on the rise. Um, we see a lot of connections between, between chemicals of concern and uh, developmental disabilities, cancer, 
uh, and diabetes and obesity. And uh, developmental disabilities now affect nearly 7% of all children aged 3 to 17. That's a huge impact, and it's dramatically increased over the last few decades. Childhood cancer rates have increased by 27% in the last 40 years. 27%. And leukemia has gone up by nearly 35% in the same time period. And childhood type 1 diabetes, uh, where you're uh, literally not making insulin properly, is, has increased by 1.8% annually from 2002 to 2012. And type 2 diabetes over the same period increased almost 5% per year. So it's an ongoing rise. Um, and we understand now the way in which chemicals in our daily environments can play a role in contributing to all of those things. So why you? Childcare environments matter. The children who come into your care are spending sometimes as many as 50 hours a week with you, on average spending 33 hours a week. And Six million children below the age of six are enrolled at child care programs, whether they're in homes or in centers or in preschools. And uh, that's a huge number. And the choices that you make and the way that you create your environment can have a huge impact on their lives. It's also the time when they're most often awake. You know, kids are, are up and active during the day when their parents are working. Um, and uh, so they're going to be engaging with their environments most, most of the time when they're with you. So now I'm going to just talk about uh, six different kinds of chemicals that we're concerned about. Some of them may sound familiar and some of them may not. And before I get into this, I just want to say I, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't have a PhD. I have a, a master's uh, degree but and a history background in environmental science. But I'm not, the information I'm going to give you is not predicting any particular child or adult health outcome. And the other thing I want to say is that I'm going to toss a bunch of information at you. And sometimes that can be a little unnerving. If you haven't really thought about what's in your couch or in the teether that you're, the baby that you're caring for is chomping on, it can be unnerving to realize that there are chemicals of concern in these seemingly innocuous products. Um, but hold on. We're going to talk about low-cost tips that you can use. And really the way I think about it is all of these exposures are sort of like the straws on top of the camel's back. Right? We never know which one it's, it's going to get you to the point where it breaks the camel's back, where we actually have a health problem occur. But every time you make a positive change, it's like you're taking one of those straws off. And if we all are doing that, we can help make sure that children uh, never actually get to the point where they're experiencing health problems. So the first kind of chemicals I'm going to talk about are flame retardants. And most often, these are, these are chemicals that are added to um, products like uh, the computer I'm using or the chair I'm sitting on, foam or plastic electronic uh, products, but also sometimes, it, sometimes in clothing, um, that are used to prevent fires from starting, the very point of ignition for a very short period of time. Unfortunately, there's evidence they're not necessarily particularly effective at actually protecting us from the house fires that they were intended to, um, which is why some changes have happened that I'll talk a little bit about. Um, but they are made out of bromine, chlorine, and phosphorus. Um, and um, you can find them in older nap mats, in padded furniture. Basically, any place there's polyurethane foam in the past was treated with flame retardant chemicals, and some point is still treated with those chemicals. You also find them in curtains. In commercial settings, uh, curtains have to meet flammability standards, and they're often treated after the cloth is produced with a a dip that basically dries, and so there's, uh, it's added on afterward. Um, you'll also find flame retardants, including some that have been banned or phased out, in uh, recycled carpet padding because they're just taking old carpet padding and putting it back into to reuse. And in some ways, that's really good. We're diverting things from the landfill. But when those materials are toxic, they're just bringing those harmful chemicals back into our everyday experience. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, electronics. So why should we be concerned? Well, this group of chemicals uh, has been linked to a number of really uh, unnerving uh, health problems, including cancer, neurological problems. Uh, a number of them contribute to infertility, both for women and for men. Um, and in fact, firefighters actually support phasing out the use of flame retardants in most applications because they don't work particularly well. And when so things do catch on fire. And when they do, 
the smoke from the fire that contains flame retardants is actually more toxic than if those chemicals weren't present. And so it makes it harder for uh, people who are trying to escape a fire to do so safely. And it also means that firefighters are exposed to these incredibly potent carcinogens that are created when the, when the smoke, uh, when the flame retardants burn, and it makes them more likely to get sick. In fact, uh, firefighters are really facing a crisis of um, developing cancer and dying from health diseases related to their work as firefighters and not from fighting fires themselves. Um, so uh, formaldehyde is another chemical that we're concerned about. It's used for in glues and adhesives primarily. So you find it gluing together the wood particles in a cabinet or furniture um, or in laminate flooring. Uh, it can be used as the, in the glue that would glue down carpeting. Um, it, sometimes it's found in permanent press uh, curtains or drapes or clothing. Um, and it can also be because if plywood is glued together, it can be found in puzzles. Uh, formaldehyde can irritate the eyes and lungs. It can sensitize people to those exposures, um, and it is known to cause cancer. So bisphenol. I hope, as an advocate who worked to get BPA banned in baby bottles and sippy cups, that you hear the word BPA or the letters BPA and you have some idea that it's a chemical used in some plastics. Um, what we found since that ban happened in 2010 here in New York is that uh, some companies reformulated to safer products and safer materials, and some companies switched to very similar chemicals. Um, and so uh, it's not just BPA. We're concerned about BPS, BPF, BPB, BPAF, basically just slight tweaks on the molecule so that they still ha it still has the same kind of structure, and it still has the same potential to disrupt our, our hormones, which is what the CNL A can do. In fact, uh, some of the uh, lesser-known bisphenols uh, have been shown to be more hormonally active, more like estrogen in our bodies than BPA. And so we can find bisphenols in food can linings, um, although there are some that are now labeled as BPA-free that appear to be not any bisphenols, which is excellent. Uh, they can still be found in some baby bottles. Uh, they've been detected in teething rings um, by research done here by our New York State Department of Health Wadsworth Laboratory, um, even in some teethers that are labeled as EPA free. Um, they are, the phenols are used to coat receipt paper, so anytime you've got a receipt that might fade in the sun, uh, the chemicals used to make that print come out, they use heat, um, those are bisphenols, and so. Um, avoiding receipts whenever you can. We'll talk about some other tips, but um, they're still found in polycarbonate plastic. So if you get a, um, the old kind of clear plastic that you used to find in baby bottles, is still found in things like the um, juice cups and soda cups that are used in restaurants, for example, or in uh, some of the plastic containers that are used for blenders or food processors. Um, so polycarbonate plastic. Um, and then also it can be used as uh, a component of the powder coating for metal. So uh, just a note. The reason we're concerned about bisphenols are that they can contribute to diabetes and obesity. Basically, they contribute to obesity, which contributes to diabetes. Um, they can cause reproductive and developmental problems um, and actual infertility. Uh, and they can also can contribute to cardiovascular disease. Okay, so from one tongue-twisting word to another, uh, phthalates are chemicals that are added to vinyl products or used as uh, carrier chemicals. They don't actually have the scent, but they carry the scent to your nose in fragrances. Um, and uh, you can find them in toys made before 2008 because they were actually banned by the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, six of them were. Um, you can find phthalates in products that are made for anyone who isn't a child. So if you've got a, a vinyl, uh, flexible vinyl shower curtain, it likely has phthalates in it. If you've got an exercise ball that's made out of vinyl, uh, it's likely got phthalates in it. Um, and the list goes on and on with just anything made for the general public, wallpaper, shelf liners, all those things made out of vinyl uh, will be um, likely to contain phthalates that would be of concern for our health. Um, you also can find it in vinyl flooring. 
uh, and you can find it, as I said, in fragrances, although if you look on the label for either a personal care product or if a cleaning product tells you anything about what, what's in the it, uh, you will not see the word phthalate um, because they use the one word fragrance to cover a whole host of chemicals. And so we can't tell by looking whether the, um, those products would actually contain phthalates. But you should likely assume that they do because testing has shown that they do in many cases. So why should we care? Well, phthalates both trigger asthma in, for people who already have had been diagnosed with asthma, but they can also cause asthma cases in people who have not had asthma before just from breathing them in. Uh, they also disrupt our hormones, so they confuse our body about what signals are trying to be sent um, and uh, can contribute to liver and thyroid harm. And they can also, in part because of the way they're, ta they're disrupting our hormones talking, contribute to obesity. So they're part of this group of new chemical new class that we call obesogens because that means to cause obesity. So the um, almost the last group of chemicals I'm going to talk with you about are called PFAS chemicals. And we used to talk about PFCs, perfluorinated compounds, and now we call them PFAS because what's happened again is as uh, companies have stop using specific chemicals, they've tweaked the molecules a little bit and continue to use the fluorine, which makes those molecules more toxic. Um, and so they've just sort of branched out. Uh, still problematic, but adhering to the letter of what people are paying attention to. And so that's why you hear me talking about bisphenols and phthalates and not just naming a specific chemical, because we have to address, address these as classes if we really want to solve the problem. So you can find PFAS chemicals as grease proofers and stain proofers and water proofers in popcorn bags and couches and carpets if you you know get a spray afterwards or a treatment to make them non stick to make them you know stain proof. Um, they're common in uh, dish wrappers, uh, food wrappers, and um, disposable dishes, including those that are compostable. Right now, um, a lot of us are now facing contamination in our drinking water because they were used in the foams for fighting fires, particularly around airports. Um, and so that's becoming an increasing issue. Um, and as you see in the bullet, the drinking water is because of either manufacturing problems or use of these firefighting foams. And what we understand about PFAS chemicals is that they, again, can disrupt our hormones by and resulting in delayed puberty. Uh, they can actually raise our cholesterol and decrease the effectiveness of vaccines uh, and immunizations. So they, um, if you are exposed to these chemicals, uh, the flu shot may not be as effective for you or other uh, critical immunizations. And there's some evidence that some of the PFAS chemicals actually contribute to cancer. OK, the last group of chemicals we're going to talk about is the one that includes uh, the chemical that you probably think about the most, which is lead, so heavy metals. Um, these include cadmium, mercury, lead, antimony, arsenic. Um, and uh, lead was uh, found in children's products at alarmingly high levels. Like we were testing um, jewelry and cars that had sometimes over 90% lead in some of the parts. Um, and uh, in the years leading up to 2008, when the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act was passed, children actually got very ill or died from ingesting little charms that were made almost entirely from lead. Um, and that was sort of the wake-up call that lead was still being used in kids' stuff. Unfortunately, we still find it in, in some places, and, and we find cadmium and, and antimony and arsenic um, other places as well. So uh, toys made before 2008, particularly things like uh, toy cars, uh, frequently had heavy metals in them, either in the paint or the metal itself. Uh, zipper pulls today, so kids wearing hoodies and sucking on that zipper pull as they're thinking um, are potentially being exposed to particularly cadmium, what we're finding most often right now. Um, they're found in, in rhinestones. We find them often in jewelry kits because they're inexpensive metals. Um, they're in some recycled plastics, so we still find them in, um, in some like inexpensive plastics. Um, we definitely find heavy metals lead in drinking water, particularly from the pipes. Um, and mercury can be found in fluorescent lights and old thermometers uh, and old thermostats. And heavy metals 
uh, can have a wide range of health problems as well. Um, most uh, commonly known as the fact that lead decreases IQ um, and can lead to brain disease, but it also has other effects on our brain. So lead can actually contribute to the increase in aggression and decrease in ability to make good decisions. Um, it can uh, heavy metals can delay puberty, contribute to heart disease, and actually there are very few organs in our body that lead has not been shown to have a negative impact on. So um, the image that I'm showing you here is like a little jewelry kit that we tested a few years back where um, one of the terms had, it says 248,000 parts per million, that's 25% cadmium. Um, and so this is an ongoing problem that uh, needs to be addressed. Okay, I've gotten the bad news over. Now we're gonna talk about ways you can make low or no cost changes in your own program to avoid these chemicals of concern. And I'm going to talk about the low-cost things, and then also, if you're making big purchasing decisions anyway, I'm going to offer you some suggestions about things to think about for those big-ticket items. Because nothing, in my view, is worse than having just invested in something fairly expensive only to find out that it contains something you really don't want because it wasn't on the label or you didn't have the information. So we're going to talk about both. But really, I hope you'll be able to focus in and make some quick changes based on the, the lower no-cost options. So for flame retardant chemicals, um, you're probably doing this already. Frequently damp dusting and damp mopping to remove dust will go a long way to pull out a lot of chemicals of concern, including flame retardants from the daily environment for children and for you. Um, maintain your padded product. So if you have an old couch or an old rocking chair, um, don't allow raw foam to be exposed because it, then the flame retardants that are in there will break down and, and come out into your dust more quickly. Remove foam-based books. So if you have anything that's got foam inside it, uh, like with a cloth around it, um, pull those out, particularly if they're older. And the same is true with uh, older foam-based chairs, like little uh, things like this chair here. Um, if you can see my, uh, my video. Um, but they're, you know, they're little chairs made for toddlers that are made entirely from foam, pretty much, uh, and then they've got fabric around them. Um, when you're thinking about your um, window dressing, think about wood or aluminum blinds and no curtains, because that way you don't have to have the flame retardant uh, chemicals added to cloth. Um, and it limits the amount of electronics you have present in your spaces, particularly where children are, because the flame retardants actually bloom out to the surface of the product. Um, and get into your dust. So for big steps, make sure when you replace your nap mats that you know that the products you're buying are free of flame retardants. Our understanding is that most companies have made that switch, but it's really important that you ask. Costs pretty much always are flame retardant free because they don't have any foam padding to can burn. Only use uh, carpets in area carpets if you really want someplace soft. Um, and remove carpeting because carpet actually absorbs a lot of those chemicals of concern, um, even if it isn't um, problematic in and of itself. Uh, carpet padding underneath, though, should definitely be avoided because it can be bringing those flame retardant chemicals back in. And just in general, limit your use of things that are made with polyurethane foam. One of the good things that's happened um, is that um, laws and regulations in California have changed so that, that uh, manufacturers of children's products no longer are required to add flame retardant chemicals. And so you'll see this label over here that um, has a right, red circle. It says Technical Bulletin 113-2013 or 117-2013. And um, these, these notices appear on most furniture, including toddler chairs. Um, and will tell you whether flame retardants have been added or not. Uh, and if you don't have that label, you should definitely ask before you're making any kind of big purchase with foam. From, for formaldehyde, look for low formaldehyde labels. There's, a, again, a California regulation that would drive that. Um, and ask furniture makers if they're um, using flame formaldehyde-free composite board or, or materials and choose solid wood whenever you can. Um, if you're thinking about flooring, consider solid materials, again, like wood or tile, um, and um, definitely ask about how things are going to be glued down, et cetera. Bisphenols, 
You can look for BPA-free cans, and they actually will be inherently safer. Allow glass biggie bottles in your program. This sounds a little scary. Some of them are now sold with silicone wrappers around them to help contain and prevent breaks, um, but it can go a long way uh, to avoiding a whole host of chemicals of concern. Um, offer non-plastic heating options. So whether that's a frozen uh, washcloth, then you can toss in the washing machine after a baby is done using it, or uh, allowing them to chew on a spoon or a wooden spoon. There are always a uh, of things using ordinary materials um, that you know the, the content of rather than um, buying plastic heating rings, which don't really tell you what's in them, and uh, we've seen some evidence that can, can contain bisphenol. And then finally, with receipt paper, again, it's on the coating. Uh, avoid uh, receipt paper and don't let kids play with receipts. So say no thanks to a receipt if you can. Um, for big stuff, think about a whole bunch of other places where you're using plastic for food, particularly um, replace those plastic cups with polypropylene, glass or stainless steel, replace clear plastic pitchers uh, for putting out on the tables with the kids with polypropylene or stainless steel. For phthalates, one of the big tips is to not accept uh, donated toys because oftentimes they'll come from time before regulations were uh, in place and being um, considered to remove and remove any toys that were made from before 2008. So that includes foam blocks that are wrapped in vinyl and things like that. In general, don't buy adult items and repurpose them for children if they're made out of vinyl. You can assume that those there are phthalates of concern in there. Um, and avoid products that contain the word fragrance. Um, you should know what's in the products that you're buying and really you should be avoiding fragrances in general for uh, a host of reasons. These people are sensitive to a lot of the chemicals even if they're um, sometimes even essential oils. Um, but the word fragrance does not give you enough information and you should avoid that. If you are redoing your space, uh, replace vinyl floors with non-vinyl options. Don't use vinyl wallpaper and don't put on vinyl siding. It's uh, we could talk about that more, but we're running short on time. So I just want to say that these kinds of choices make a difference. So our colleagues at Breast Cancer Prevention Partners uh, had a group of people uh, eat their normal diet and then have their bodies tested for phthalates and bisphenol A, and then they had a chef actually recreate their foods only out of fresh stuff, no packaging. Um, and what they found is that the body burden cells, so the amount of chemicals in their body, BPA dropped by 66%, and phthalates dropped by more than half. So when we make changes in avoiding plastic, we can see a huge difference in our bodies. These, these chemicals move through, but we're exposed to them all the time. And we really can make a difference. And when you're thinking about plastic, avoid plastics number three, six, and seven. Uh, those are the, the primary ones to avoid. The safest ones are two, four, and five. Uh, two more slides on the bad news, and then we will wrap up, or the good news. Um, so to avoid PFAS chemicals, you can actually make your own popcorn by a jar of popcorn kernels and some brown paper bags. Pour some popcorn kernels into the bag, roll it up, leave it loose, but roll it up a bit. All the bag does is keep the popcorn from flying around your microwave, so it's easy to take out and gives you something to carry it in. Um, choose reusable dishes instead of uh, single-use ones, particularly uh, compostable ones right now, unfortunately, are bound together with PFAS chemicals. Um, a lot of times people think about cookware as a durable item, right? They're going to keep it for a long period of time. But if you've ever looked at the advice about nonstick uh, pans, you'll see that, uh, in fact, you're supposed to get rid of them as soon as they're scratched. And they can scratch really quickly. Um, and so instead of using nonstick cookware, consider things like glass baking dishes, stainless steel uh, cookie trays and uh, pots for boiling water, cast iron for frying, um, and uh, avoid nonstick coatings wherever you can. And also just be aware that if it says PFOA free, PFOA, it does not actually necessarily mean that it's free of all of the chemicals we're concerned about. So um, companies are not being very transparent about what they're making their products out of and what those nonstick coatings are, and so at this time we can't advise that there's a safer nonstick coating. Um, big steps if you are replacing your carpet or uh, your curtains or your furnishings, avoid uh, stain proofers. 
um, or grease proofers or water proofers, those added chemicals are most often PFAS chemicals. Um, so for heavy metals, again, removing toys from before 2008. Um, when it comes to drinking water, making sure that every time the water has stood for several hours, you open the tap and only use cold water for cooking, even for making boiling water for pasta or things like that, um, and flush the water. So uh, turn to open the tap and wait until it, the temperature changes and it drops. You can actually feel it on the inside of your wrist the same way that you can feel uh, the temperature for a baby bottle. Um, Treat old thermostats and thermometers and solaris and life as hazardous waste because they contain mercury and it does not take much mercury to contaminate uh, lakes and streams uh, to the point that, that you can't eat the fish in them. Don't use adult costume jewelry for children. So if you've got a necklace and it gets a little ding, costume jewelry for adults still can contain lead. And if you go shopping and you see a label on costume jewelry that says not intended for children under 14, that's because they're not paying attention to whether or not there is lead present. Um, don't hand over things like adult keys or plumbing brass as toys. Again, sort of avoiding things that are meant for adults because they're not being tracked for their impact on children. Um, and we highly recommend testing your water to find out whether or not there is lead in it so that you can take action. So just briefly, uh, if you are interested in demonstrating that you are taking steps to protect the health of the children in your care by improving the environment, uh, there's an Eco Healthy Child Care Endorsement Program, and this link, cehn.org slash ehcc, will take you there and you can learn about it. There's a questionnaire, uh, a checklist with 30 questions. If you can answer 24 of those or more um, in the positive, including the required questions, then you can become endorsed and they give you materials to help share the news with parents and, and provide additional support, which is what this slide tells you about. Um, I'm going to just briefly skip over this, but I just want to say that there's a national campaign working to get the companies that sell directly to you to make sure that they're only using safer materials. So we did a report on this and uh, are now actually in conversations with Excelligence and identified that community placing has screened out chemicals of concern and has a process. Um, and you can learn more about all of this at gettingreadynumber4baby.org. And here are some resources, a whole host of um, places to go to learn more about chemicals of concern and, and child care. And I just want to say thanks so much for watching this webinar. I hope you found it informative. Please feel free to get in touch with us if you have any follow-up questions. And I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks.